I'm speaking with Martha Wells, author of Fugitive Telemetry, The Murderbot Diaries, Book 6, published to be published April 27, 2021 by Tor.com or Tor. Um, thank you for speaking with me. Oh, thank you for inviting me. So first, um, so obviously this is part of a series um, and, and you've written a lot. You've been uh, nominated for numerous awards and you've won numerous awards. Um, how does, uh, with all the ideas that you have going through your head for stories, how do you, um, focus on one? How does one idea stand out? Uh, it's just, uh, I'm not really much of a person who plots in advance. Um, I kind of tend to feel my way through the story. Um, it's usually when I start working on the beginning and, um, does it feel like I've got a lot of story to tell. Am I excited about it? Mm -hmm. um, I kind of have to be excited about it to, to be able to write. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do I, when I do a few pages, do I want to come back to it? Does it keep coming to mind? Do I keep thinking of things that should happen next. Mm -hmm. Mostly that's, that's what it is. Okay. And um, does that, does that mean you've started a number of stories and, and partway through you've, you put them aside because they're not, they're not maintaining that excitement. Yeah. Sometimes um, I didn't used to have that happen. Uh, pretty much in the earlier part of my career, everything I started and got maybe at least a chapter on, I, I kept working on mm -hmm. uh, when I was having my career crash in the later, like around 2006, 2007, I probably started five or six different novels and then had them peter out. Um, usually much further along. I've had one that's gone about 50,000 words, but then I kind of realized I had a real, I still liked it, but I had a real problem with it. And it took me like years to figure out I was, it was actually writing two books and one was not very good at all. And one was great, but they're sort of hopelessly intertwined at this point. And at some point I'm going to have to go back there and just kind of peel them apart and see if I can get the great one uh, to keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, and, and I do that more often, I think with short stories where I think I've got an idea for a short story and I start it and I'm telling, oh, this didn't really go, you know, like I wanted it to, it's not really, you know, interesting to me anymore. Mm -hmm. do, do you, so when you're talking about interesting, do you mean the characters, sort of the plot, the conflict? Yeah, it's, it has to be really engaging to me. It's almost like as a writer, I'm almost trying, I'm trying to write something that I want to read. And so if it's not engaging to me on both levels, um, I can be, I can look at it and think, well, this is technically really uh, good, but if it's not engaging me as a reader, then I'm not going to continue with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, let's talk about this uh, latest novella. So I'll admit I haven't read any of the series. It's on my to be read list. Definitely. Um, I do want to read them, but you know, there's so many things to, <laughs> <laughs> to draw our time but um but tell me about um the series the protagonist um the conflict of this latest one and uh the setting if you could the it's far far future science fiction uh the main character is murderbot who's a part human part machine construct that's enslaved as a security unit that's basically in this in this um kind of world spanning um corporation rim that that's what happens to constructs they're either security units or comfort units and um it's actually they have governor modules that control them basically in every um in every way and punish them if they disobey orders or even think too hard about disobeying an order mm -hmm. um murderbot's been able to hack its governor module so it's actually free but it doesn't know what to do with that freedom. And then it discovers the, cause the conventional wisdom in the, in the society is that if a construct like this, especially a sec unit does become free, it'll immediately go on a rampage and kill all the humans and, and uh, that kind of thing. And Murderbot could do that, but it doesn't want to. It discovers the streaming services, basically that the, all the, the, the feed, which is their version of the internet, brings to it all this entertainment and books and movies and TV and music. And instead it gets involved watching that 
while still doing its job hmm. and just kind of not sure what to do next. And then it gets, in, um, it gets rented by a group of explorers who are from a different culture who, who have better, um, more progressive ideas towards um, bots and that they've never encountered a construct before. They just know what other people have told them, but it actually likes these people. Mm-hmm. And when they get in danger, it has to reveal that it's uh, hacked its governor module in order to save them. And that was kind of the concept and everything behind All Systems Red, which was the first novella. Mm-hmm. And at the end of All Systems Red, um, Murderbot is able to get free and the rest are its adventures. And it eventually encounters these people again um, and has to go back and help them again. Uh, Fugitive Telemetry is uh, actually a prequel novella to Network Effect, which is the novel. And it's set on um, Preservation Station, which is the home of Murderbot's human friends Mm -hmm. and where Murderbot gets involved with the murder investigation that takes place. The state, it's a very um, um, low, low crime society and particularly a station that's very like never has anything happen basically. So when a murder happens, it's a big, huge deal. Mm -hmm. And Murderbot goes in to help them investigate kind of whether they want it or not. <laughs> right. Okay, okay. I, I, I'm curious, um, since you've written so many words for this series, I'm, I'm interested in, in knowing why they're all novellas and, and maybe you haven't pushed it to the novel length. Well, I Network Effect is a novel, but okay. uh, it started out because it started out as a short story. Originally, it was going to be a one-shot short story. Mm-hmm. And then when I started working on it, it needed a bigger... Um, kind of a bigger canvas. So I was going to make it a novella and I wanted to, I was looking at the tour.com novella program, which I think was in its second year. Mm -hmm. And I'd read uh, a lot of the novellas that they put out so far and really, really enjoyed them. So I wanted to, and they're, the design is so fabulous of the little, the little uh, paperback books they do and everything. So I was like, I wanted a novella too. So I decided to go ahead and I talked to my agent and she thought it was a good idea. And so when it was done, she submitted it to them. And then again, it was just going to be a one-shot novella at that point. And, but then they asked for a second novella and I decided to write a sequel. And then by the time I finished the sequel, I realized there was a lot more story I could tell here. And I went ahead and we talked about it and did decided to do two more novellas. Mm -hmm. And then it just all kind of expanded from there. (laughs) The novel was after that. We decided to do the novel after that. And, um, because there was a story I wanted to tell that went back to the second, the second novella where Murderbot meets a, um, a starship that becomes its friend and helps it and everything. And I wanted to get that character back into the story. And Network Effect was when I finally thought of a way to get that character back into the story. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because sometimes I think I've read um, a few times, you know, like with novels, you have extra plot lines. So I'm curious if, does the novella format allow you to just have a sleek you know, like a story that's, that's ultra focused. Yeah, it has to be ultra focused. And um, because you've only got under 40,000 words. So you have to really concentrate on that main storyline. Um, I like writing novels before then. I think I've before all systems read, I'd only written a couple of, well, I'd written four novellas that were for the books of the Raxura series, which was, um, my previous fantasy series, which went to five novels. Mm -hmm. Um, So those were kind of telling other little side stories that I wanted to tell, but didn't think there would be, you know, room for enough stuff there for an entire book. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's like, um, it's really funny that I'm kind of known for novellas now because it's not really something I've I've done a lot of before. I was mostly concentrated on novels. Mm. Okay. And so for um, this series and, and perhaps for this particular novella, um, did you do any, it, was there any research that you had to do? I know it's science fiction. Um, so. Yeah. The thing with science fiction is it's hard to stay ahead of our own technology because it just keeps advancing so, so quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, like it will just in network effect, there was one scene with like a, a car and a self-driving car kind of thing. And my editor was like, you know, you need to make this fancier because we have this now. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> give it some more capability or something. But um, yeah, I didn't do, I haven't done a ton of research. Most of my research that I drew on was actually my experience um, 
working on databases and writing programs um, in the, oh, I guess it's the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, when I am doing online, uh, doing websites and um, user interfaces kind of stuff. Uh, that's where a lot of my um, kind of inspiration for in Murderbot's world came from. I'm speaking with Martha Wells, author of Fugitive Telemetry. You can find more information about her work at MarthaWells.com. If you like this episode of Full Contact Nerd Interviews so far, please tap the like button and hit the subscribe button. If you want interviews with writers and creative people or daily book suggestions in sci-fi, fantasy, horror, film history, gaming, and more, check out FullContactNerd.com and my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews. If you want to hear interviews with military historians or get daily history book suggestions, check out warscholar.org and my podcast, Military History Inside Out. If you want to hear interviews with space scientists, space historians, and technology experts, or get daily space and science book suggestions, check out technologyinspace.com and my podcast, Technology and Space. All of my social media links are listed at the end of this episode. Now back to the video. Okay. So um, tell me a little bit more, or tell me some um, some of the things that inspire you as far as your imagination. That could be books, movies, music, uh, shows, films. Um, I watch a lot of media. For inspiration, I guess, um, for my fantasy, I tend to be inspired by landscapes a lot. I try to do, I do, Lately, I've been doing really unusual secondary world stuff. So I've been kind of look at strange formations and things and think about what would, what if this was a city here? What would that happen? You know, what would the, that be like? Um, for, uh, for Murderbot, I've read uh, Ancillary Justice and um, the rest. I think Anne Leckie's whole trilogy was out before All Systems Red came out. But um, that was a big inspiration also kind of earlier, I'd been inspired by the movie War Games, which came out, oh, I don't remember how long ago, maybe in 83? the 80s. 83, yeah. I watched it when I was well, um, probably in college. And just that whole idea of the supercomputer that instead of doing the normal thing at the time period in fiction and in media of deciding to kill all the people is it um, instead decided that the war is not worth it. And that it can, and I'd kind of been thinking for a long time about the way AI are written and how a lot of the times, even when the stories are really good, it feels like the AI is kind of limited because it only wants what a human would want and not what an AI would want. And there's always this assumption that a uh, machine intelligence would want to become human. And in uh, Anne Leckie's trilogy, you see a lot of why would this the, um, the main character doesn't want to become human and you see how limiting having to be in human form is for that character. So mm -hmm. thinking a lot of things about that. Um, and Leckie also had a great quote where she was talking about the idea of um, the, the, the kind of the trope of the, the, the AI that becomes super, uh, um, becomes sentient and wants to kill the humans, kill its creators, is sort of like uh, almost like a, a slave narrative because that we have to have the idea that we know we've done something to the AI. We know we've done something, we've enslaved this entity. So we have to make it evil in order to justify that enslavement. We weren't bad people enslaving it. We, were, we, we knew it was bad all along and now you know it's proving us right as opposed to we're just doing a bad thing. Um, so yeah, I was thinking a lot about that as far as Murderbot goes and kind of wanting to explore that. And a lot of it came with just creating the character and thinking about what it would do. Um, Murderbot does, um, a lot of the TV shows mentioned in, or the, the shows that are mentioned in, um, the Murderbot series are kind of semi-based on real shows just so to help me kind of keep track of what will be happening on them. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's fun to, those are fun to pick out. <laughs> So it's interesting that uh, the series is also described as it, it falls sort of under crime sci-fi. Yeah. Um, 
And so, so one, I'm curious if that is that, would you say that's correct? And two, what about crime stories? Tell me about your interest in that. Uh, I've always liked uh, uh, mysteries and fictional mysteries and then true crime stories. I watch a lot of true crime on TV, hmm. uh, Dateline and 48 Hours and um, uh, the documentaries and everything. I just watched a couple on his HBO uh, the other day. Um, but I don't know. I, I just always been interested in them. The mystery of how you figure out what's, what's going on, what's really going on as opposed to what people think is going on or what they tell you is going on mm -hmm. and the way people are, especially in our society are kind of are railroaded into prison based on, you know, flimsy evidence and just mm -hmm. how, how an actual real investigator who is really trying to get to the truth, how different their process is from sometimes our criminal justice system. Um, and I think probably Murderbot gets labeled under crime because it's, um, it's a security unit. And even after it frees itself, it still tends to um, gravitate to situations where it has to protect people uh, it has to kind of, un and to protect people, it often has to unravel what's the mystery of what's going on. Mm -hmm. The fugitive telemetry is, I think, the first one where the mystery is really a, a classic murder mystery. They find a person who's dead and they have to investigate and figure out, you know, how this person got here, who they are and what happened to them. Uh, the others are both, the mysteries are not quite so um, laid out in the classic mystery pattern as, as the fugitive telemetry one. Okay. Is this the first time you've written sort of a, a classic mystery type story or novel or novella? Not really. Um, my third novel, The Death of the Necromancer, was a fantasy mystery. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of adventure elements in it too, but the main plot line was um, a series of murders in this city and the main character and... Um, the, the secondary characters trying to figure out what had happened and who was doing this and where they were. Mm -hmm. um, and also I did a, a sh like a couple of years ago, I want to say recently, but time just has no meaning right now. But uh, mm -hmm. I did a short story set in that um, same universe with two of the, with the main character and the, the second main character and uh, solving a mystery called a night at the opera, which mm -hmm. was a short fiction mystery. Mm -hmm. um, fantasy mystery <laughs> but uh yeah so um and mysteries are difficult <laughs> i know i had i have a lot of friends who are mystery writers and um i always feel like just it's it's um it's a if you're doing it right <laughs> it's probably really hard <laughs> especially the way i do where i don't plot out much in advance i felt kind of weird doing mysteries like that until one of my friends um said that, yeah, he did the same way. He didn't know who was going to be the, 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 the murderer until he got like two thirds of the way through the book. Hmm. So, um, um, yeah, <laughs> but it's always just been kind of a favorite. Um, um, one of my favorite things to read all kinds of different mysteries, whether they're classic or in science fiction, fantasy or contemporary or historical or whatever. Okay. So what, um, so for Fugitive Telemetry and maybe for the, the whole series, the whole Murderbot series, what would you say is the um, sort of the musical aesthetic that, that it would have if, if it were a show or a movie, say? Uh, probably fairly um, kind of slick and, um, um, but a bit grungy around the edges. Um, mm -hmm. What I would love it to have is the same aesthetic that The Expanse has. That's in one of my recent favorite science fiction series. And I love the way they do the graphics and um, show the navigation information when they're telling you where the setting is and that kind of stuff. And all the little neat things, they, little, little neat touches to it that are just like really build the universe. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you see all sorts of different places. You see the very fancy rich people places and government places. And then you see the, the very um, bare bones kind of places where people, the poor people live. And, and so something like that would be, that would be really cool. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, whenever I think of uh, sci-fi and, and say mystery, um, I think, you know, noir. You know, mm -hmm. and is that, is that, does that always have to be the case or, you know, can you, you know, can it be something different? 
Well, I think it can. I think you can have a sci-fi mystery under any, uh, under every, any kind of setting. Mm. Uh, and Lecky has another one that's kind of set in the same universe as the ancillary series where it takes place on this planet that's um, um, fairly bucolic and among people who are fairly well off. Uh, uh, and so that's a, um, but that's a, that's a mystery story basically as they're figuring out these events that happened. Mm -hmm. There's also one recently, um, gosh, now I've forgotten the name. It's winter something. Oh, shoot. Who's the I give author? It a blurb. Ah, Everina Maxwell. Yeah. Winter's Orbit, I think. Okay. It's a new book. I, it's, I feel silly because I gave it a blurb. I really did read it. <laughs> I <had> a little, <laughs> uh, remembering titles and stuff. And I read it last year. I read it in manuscript first, actually. Mm -hmm. um, that's a mystery set, uh, basically a kind of royal palace in a small um, local system empire kind mm -hmm. of. Um, so yeah, you can have science fiction mysteries everywhere. I like noir science fiction mysteries. Like I really enjoyed the Altered Carbon series that they mm -hmm. did on Netflix, both, both seasons of it. Um, that was a great noir science fiction where it's so dark, mm -hmm. but it's just really intriguing and really enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Is there um, any particular field in science that, that you're particularly attracted to um, that you'd like to study the most? Well, I was a, I have a BA than um, anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, so I always really, and I really liked archeology. span um, So it's probably the most I'd be interested in. Uh, I, if I could, I'd go back and uh, do that again, but um, I'm not sure how talented I was at it. <laughs> I had a lot of trouble telling normal dirt from burial fill. And that's kind of, <laughs> a, that's kind of essential when you do Southwestern archeology. span yeah. so. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've dabbled a little bit in, in amateur, you know, um, volunteer archaeology, and I, I know what you're talking about sifting yeah. through the, <laughs> the dirt. Yeah. yeah, we dug through some stuff before we, when we were students out there, <laughs> before they, they realized what we were doing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, um, takes a lot more work than I think people <laughs> realize just looking at archaeologists on TV, TV yeah. shows. Yeah. That's the, yeah. The stuff doesn't come out of the ground nice and, and pretty clean. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask about the, um, y your writing process. Um, is there, would you say there's anything out of the ordinary you do or different from other writers that you do to finish your drafts or the final work? Um, not really. I like uh, revision better than doing first draft. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of, um, how to writing things say, oh, just write the first draft and don't worry if it's bad and don't go back and, and until you finish and all that. But I go back a lot because I, because of the way I kind of feel my way through the story, I have to have things straight in my head before I can go on with the rest of the plot. So a lot of times when I realize I've gone wrong somewhere and there needs to be a change, I have to go back and put that in. Otherwise I'll forget what I'm doing later. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's, and so, it takes me a longer time, but basically when I get to the end, um, it's, it should be in pretty good shape at that point to where I'll, I'll need to go back and, and do a revision before it, anybody reads it. But um, I should be almost there, basically. And when I go back to do the revision, I'm looking for the, the revision after it's finished. I'm looking for stuff that I didn't notice the first time and, you know, and that kind of thing where I'm kind of like solidifying different uh, plot points and, and shoring things up. Um, so I don't think that's really different from what a lot of people do, but especially people who are kind of um, pantsers mm -hmm. <laughs> like um, uh, I am. Okay. But you don't need any, uh, like sometimes people say, you know, they have to have their coffee before they start writing or they need a walk or something like that. No, I don't. Um, I just need a laptop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I used to write um, before, Ages ago, when I was doing my first book, I, I ended up doing a lot of it and um, just writing on paper. And then when I would go to work with at work was the only place I had a computer. So I'd type it in there, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of good because then you get a second revision as you're going over your first draft mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to type it in. But, yeah, I don't need anything. We always um, laugh at the people um, who like 
uh, on TV that need that on the remodeling shows where they need a special writing room built before they can write their novel. <laughs> and, uh, or like one person had a tree house, a special writing tree house built. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, so it's kind of laughing. I mean, I, I, I do it mostly. I write like upstairs in my bedroom uh, because Uh, I can spread books out if I have, I'm looking at pictures or something for descriptions or whatever, I can spread them out on the bed. And -hmm. the cats are trying to get up on me quite as much if they have a place where they can sit near me. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I've written in very noisy offices um, where there was an air cleaner for the, um, for the system that was like, you know, blowing cold air down on me and, you know, mainframes making noise and everything so i can write pretty much anywhere Hmm. okay okay it sounds like the cats have a a strong influence on sort of the uh your 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 environment you're right yeah they really do i didn't intend that you know i've always had cats but um we've got three of them now and so yeah that's that's a lot (laughs) yeah yeah that's a fair amount um so so you've been writing for for you know, a good, good number of years now, how, how has your approach to writing changed when you started, you know, when you first were published to, to this point? When I was first published, I didn't, I don't really think I had any idea what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I just managed to write this book. And um, even though I was uh, in a fan group at the university I went to and mm-hmm. had met professional authors and listened to them talk and, uh, gone to seminars and everything and uh, gone to conventions and was a chairman of a science fiction convention. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I kind of knew enough about publishing, but not really all the ins and outs. And um, like, I didn't start, I should have started my second book immediately after the first, which I think is important. It's like, you, you shouldn't have to do that, but nowadays it's, or even back then too, it's so important to, if you're going to have a career is keep, you know, your work out there and Mm -hmm. don't leave big gaps. Mm -hmm. Um, If you want people to remember who you are and still look for your work. Um, So I don't really think I knew very much at all. And I know my writing has changed a lot is, um, I think I've improved a lot since then, um, just uh, looking at different aspects of it and learning more and um, um, learning more about the world. so I do think it's changed a lot. It's been basically my first novel came out in 1993 mm-hmm. and the internet was around, but um, most people were off in separate um, bulletin boards and, you know, news groups and that kind of thing. And you didn't have the immediate feedback. I was actually talking about this at a thing I did yesterday where I mean, you did the book and they published it. And if you were lucky, you had a bookstore in town and you and you had a signing there and your friends had a party and then that was kind of it. And you didn't know how the book did. <laughs> if you were lucky enough to be able to go to conventions, you might have some idea. Well, you know, people are, I see my book on tables and people, you know, somebody bought it. Yay. That kind of thing. But, you know, you didn't really get a lot of information until, you know, did the publisher want to buy your next book kind of thing. Mm. And now it's like somebody puts a book out and then you can watch it either sink or swim in real time, pretty much, you know, online watching all the, how the, the ratings and all that kind of thing and Goodreads and all that. So um, I'm kind of glad I debuted back when I did, because I think it was at the time it felt incredibly stressful, but it was actually much less stressful than it is now. Hmm. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I think, um, I think uh, in your bio, I saw that Aggie con, was that what you were? Yeah. Do, do you still, um, ha, did you stay involved with uh, conventions over time or? Not really a little bit, uh, just mostly uh, after I graduated. Um, and I, when I started writing and I was, I like to go to them because all of my friends are science fiction fans and fancy fans and uh, media fan fiction fans. So that's our kind of milieu. <laughs> we go to conventions and you know, all that kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. but I haven't really worked for one in since the late eighties, really. Mm-hmm. But you still, but you still will attend them just for fun. Oh yeah. Um, 
we have some local armadillo con in Austin is one of my favorite ever conventions. And we try to go to that every year and uh, comic Palooza in Houston uh, is really nice. And then uh, there's been just long periods where um, I couldn't afford to go to out of state conventions. So I would only go to a few local ones. So it's nice now being able before the plague, being able to go, um, um, you know, to conventions I'd heard a lot about, but, you know, um, had never been able to go to before. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done uh, panels? Yeah, I go, um, I can't really go as a fan because I need for, well, for a long time, I needed to be able to take it off on my taxes and kind of justify the expense. Mm -hmm. So I was always trying to go and get on programming and do panels and the reading and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, While I was seeing my friends who were going to be there and hanging out and having fun and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I haven't just gone to one to enjoy it um, in years and years, basically. I'm, I'm, I guess I, I enjoy being on programming, so I'm still enjoying it, but it is, um, um, it is work and, uh, you do get kind of exhausted, uh, doing too much. Mm Um, I was actually talking to my husband, how we've had very, very seldom have a trip that wasn't for me, a work trip. Usually we're going to a convention and we'll go with a few friends and everyone else will be there just to enjoy stuff. And I'll have a program. (laughs) have to be on program items. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure I know how to do a vacation where we just, we just go and look at stuff and have fun and we don't, you know, and I don't have to actually do anything. Yeah. I'm speaking with Martha Wells, author of Fugitive Telemetry. You can find more information about her work at MarthaWells.com. If you like this episode of Full Contact Nerd Interview so far, please tap the like button and hit the subscribe button. If you want interviews with writers and creative people or daily book suggestions in sci-fi, fantasy, horror, film history, gaming, and more, check out fullcontactnerd.com and my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews. If you want to hear interviews with military historians or get daily history book suggestions, check out warscholar.org and my podcast, Military History Inside Out. If you want to hear interviews with space scientists, space historians, and technology experts, or get daily space and science book suggestions, check out technologyandspace.com and my podcast, Technology and Space. All of my social media links are listed at the end of this episode. Now back to the video. Do you ever, so when, you, when you've gone to cons, have you ever... Um, met anyone who you became who are you were like a fan of and became you know like the the nervous fan around them oh yeah a lot um yeah i met dill gaiman at a con and um just briefly in the i think it was in the 90s when he mm-hmm. came to our he came to an aggie con and then he came to armadillo con mm-hmm. um um yeah and then a lot of times what i do now is i'll meet other authors online and then we'll try to meet up and go to, you know, and at conventions where we, where we are. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know a lot of people that basically conventions are the only place we see each other because just our schedules and everything are so, um, um, you know, are so busy. That's the best way to get together. Mm-hmm. And that's a big enjoyment. That's a big one of the things I enjoy at conventions is getting to hang out with other authors that I know and go out to eat and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's like it's, something that you can do with on these. The online conventions are really cool because, again, everybody gets to enjoy them. You know, if you can get as long as you can get online, you can enjoy it. But I miss the the socializing parts and the dinners and going to meet new restaurants and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I've gone to conventions, um, I, I started noticing that that it seemed like it was the one time when a lot of author friends could actually get to talk with each other. You know, it, like. Yeah. I always thought they always hung out and kept in touch, but it seemed like conventions were the ch- the touch point, so to speak. Yeah, there's a lot of hanging out online, but again, you get so busy, I think, and you know, it's you talk to each other briefly on Twitter or you email or something, and it's not as satisfying as actually being able to sit and talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, you you've already touched on some of the um sort of the the education and, and work that you've done outside of writing but is there any other did you have any other work um that sort of affected how or what you've written uh, not really 
Um, I do a lot of reading um, and, um, but I don't of different things. And I, I read a lot of news um, so I can be panicked all the time about what's going on. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. and that i'm sure that influences me but um no that's about it mm -hmm. okay okay um I really don't have any other hobbies that aren't involved with reading and writing and watching mm -hmm. media so okay okay Do, are you at all a gamer or have you been a gamer either board or video games yeah i did i used to do more video games but i have Ten, I had tendonitis, particularly in this, my right hand, mm -hmm. and then other problems with it. Now I have rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. So I kind of try to, I don't let myself get into the video games as much in, as, as I would like to. Mm -hmm. I am, I do gaming sometimes. I've done role-playing games um, and I really like those. Um, I like, um, um, the idea now of you can get on zoom and do uh, actually do a role-playing game with your friends in other parts of the country and everything. And, um, what, what, yeah. uh, what games have you enjoyed the most over time? Uh, probably right now. Uh, the big one was Pathfinder. Okay. I really like that, but mm -hmm. I've done all kinds of different stuff. We used to do the, um, um, there was an Arthurian role-playing game we got into, I think, I think it was after I graduated college, I was playing it with people and that was a fun one. Do you remember uh, it? I can't remember the name at all. That sounds pretty cool. I still have the box up there. It wasn't super popular. Mm -hmm. I want to say it was maybe a Chaosium game okay. uh, put out by them, but um, um, it had the cool castle maps, which were really interesting to look at and, and um I'm not even sure how much we played it, but it was just a really, it was just a really interesting game. Mm -hmm. And and video games, like, were there any that you really like uh, became oh, uh, really, obsessed with? I loved Zoo Tycoon. I love Civilization, mm -hmm. um, uh, Sim City, not the Sims, but the Sim City where you would like have build the gigantic city and then take care of it, and, mm -hmm. um, and those kind of things. Um, I did one of the really early first person shooters um, where you were killing Nazis. That was very satisfying. You go through the, all the different levels of the castle and kill Nazis until you can escape. Yeah. Um, but yeah, stuff like that. But again, it's like I've had to, you know, restrain myself. I, I would spend a lot of time at it. I've got an obsessive personality. So if I did it again, it would just, I would really have to control myself. But um yeah, having the hand problem really kind of stops me from doing that. Yeah. And in your bio, I saw that uh, it said because of your anthropology studies, you really delve into world building. Um, do you go f far beyond what you need for anything you write or do you just kind of go to what you need? And, and I kind of just go to what I need. Sometimes I'll come up with a lot of stuff that I'll, I'll think I'm going to use and then I end up not using it. Mm -hmm. But mostly since I kind of, develop the world and develop the character at the same time. I'm really trying to create a world that, that, that would have created this character and that I want to see them move around. So everything's kind of really entwined. So I build it as I'm going. I usually have a vision for kind of what I want it to look like or feel like. And then I kind of build that as I'm going along. When I did my first couple of books, I did a lot more world building in advance. Mm -hmm. um, because I thought that was what you were supposed to do. But then later I got into it. It's like, no, nah, I'm going to just do look for stop and like look stuff up and look for what I need as I'm going along. Mm -hmm. So um, were there any previous versions of murder bot in existence before you settled on murder bots final form? And, and, and... no, not at all. It, mm -hmm. um, that was an interesting, it, it's that story kind of came to me. Um, pretty quickly. It only took me, uh, I'm not a super fast writer and it only took me about a month to do the first novella. Mm -hmm. um, the others have been harder. Um, each of the other novellas takes me about three months to do. Mm -hmm. And usually what I'm doing is I'm writing a lot, like 10,000, 20,000 words, and then having to cut most of that out back under 5,000 and start again. Mm -hmm. It's like, I really have to kind of feel around to figure out 
what the plot should be and how it should go. And, and the logistics are often very difficult. Mm-hmm. Like for the novel Network Effect, it took me 18 months to write. And usually for a novel that size, it would be under a year. So um, that, was, <laughs> that was a lot of work. It was probably most of that time was just getting the first 50,000 words down. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, having to write and cut stuff out and write and cut stuff out. It's just um, just the fact that the character, the character can access all these security cameras and other systems. So it has multiple viewpoints, even though it's written in first person, Mm -hmm. it's seeing things that are occurring um, all around it in other areas. Um, So having to make that work, it just takes a lot of kind of logistical tinkering um, and particularly the fight scenes um, to, to really give that, that feeling of a being that is seeing these, all these different views and being able to do all these different things at one time. You have a writing a character that can multitask to that extent. It's kind of hard because you have, you have to really, um, really work at it to try to make that feel realistic. Also a character that's sort of existing, um, at a slower rate than it, it, it thinks so fast, so much faster than the humans. It has a lot of more time than they do to react to things. And trying to give that impression is also kind of tricky. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, they're not, they're not easy to do. They're, they're very rewarding, but they're not easy to write. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, fans, you know, it's on, you've written a number of these already and fans want more. Do, are you still excited by the character? Are there more stories to tell or, um, yeah, I think there are. Um, I'm definitely going to do more Murderbot. Um, I'm taking a break right now doing a fantasy novel mm-hmm. because with the whole COVID thing, I just, I did not have the mental resources to write Murderbot. Mm-hmm. Um, I did have, I have like a, like probably three or four or five uh, starts that um, that's cats in the background. If you can hear that. I had three or four or five starts uh, to different novels and stories I was trying to do and they didn't, they didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just don't think I had enough concentration last year, especially between March and about July Mm -hmm. to be able to um, do it. But I'm, I feel really glad I was able to actually get started on a fantasy novel. Um, Because at this point, if I still hadn't been able to get started on anything, I'd feel pretty terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, I write all the time, so uh, it's kind of my main uh, outlet and everything. So I don't think I'd be doing pretty well if I very well if I couldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Are you one of those writers who imposes like a minimum word per day requirement? Well, before the before the plague, I did. I I usually try to get at least a thousand words a day, but I haven't been able to do that. And actually, on Network Effect, I had a lot of trouble when I was having to just kind of very slowly work my way through it. I was usually getting between 500 and 700 words a day. Mm-hmm. And that's why I've been trying to hit now. Um, sometimes I can actually get a thousand, but it's pretty rare. Um, I think I need to, you know, it's like, but it's still working. I mean, if I have a finished book at the end of it, I'm not going to worry too much about um, how long it took me or <laughs> what I did per day, as long as, you know, the finished product is there. Mm-hmm. So considering, you know, obviously, I think we all know the differences between fantasy and sci-fi, more or less the elements and such, but you personally, what, um, when you decide, you know, I'm going to work on a sci-fi today or my fantasy, you know, what, what, what part of, um, what, exci- what, what pulls you to decide on each, you know, what, what elements? Well, I only write one, one thing at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I'm doing fantasy, I mean, that's what I'm going to work on. And I work on the current one project at a time. Um, The thing I, I mostly write fantasy, except I did a Star Wars novel and a couple of Stargate Atlantis novels before Murderbot, but Murderbot was just a science fiction story. When I got the idea, I'd always read science fiction and everything. It wasn't like I didn't like it as much as fantasy as I'd always read both. But Murderbot was clearly a science fiction idea and to make it a fantasy idea just would not have had the same impact, I think. Mm -hmm. But as far as fantasy, do you, are you, um, are you into, I think you mentioned landscapes and are you into sort of the, the lush feel fantasy feels like it has more of a, 
you know, it's more set in wilderness maybe, or, you know, it has that, that medieval feel. So I'm just trying to search what you like um, about it. I like, um, I just like the variety. You can do secondary world is what I mostly do. And, you know, you can do all kinds of different things. You can make base it on a historical, um, like my early stuff, a lot of time, the first, the Orion books were sort of based semi on 17th century, um, kind of La Belle epic time period, and then later going up to 19th century. Uh, and then you can do secondary world and do kind of a sword and planet thing where you just have a mix of technology and you can kind of do anything. I just like the fact you can do anything you want. With Murderbot, there's not a lot of description because Murderbot doesn't notice too many things. It, it's, it's the way it notices things is very different from the way a human would. Mm -hmm. Like it wouldn't, you know, um, describe things the same way a human would. So, um, which is something else I have to get used to when I'm writing that character. Mm -hmm. So with fantasy, I get to describe very, I get to make the environments a lot more detailed and have pretty things and, and you know, and, and, and really cool landscapes. You have, you have cool landscapes in science fiction too, but again, Murderbot doesn't quite see them as the same way a human. Mm -hmm. Of all the characters you've created, um, which one have you enjoyed writing the most? Uh, writing was probably Moon in the Books of the Raxura because that's a very fun character to write. And um, he's not nearly as hard to write as Murderbot is. Hmm. Um, so that's probably still one of my favorite characters to write. I love Murderbot and I love doing that character, but um, it does it is kind of exhausting at times <laughs> yeah yeah I get, like you say with the the limited sort of uh, point of view maybe or, or vision that the character has yeah it's um well it's the it it's points of view are all these systems and cameras mm -hmm. so it tends to um i don't know it doesn't it, the environments it's moving through sometimes are mostly space stations and um though i did have some fun describing the really um just banana pants ornate you know rich people space stations and what they would have there and, and stuff and um mm. but um yeah it's just a very different viewpoint and i kind of really in, in maintaining that viewpoint is really what makes is the verisimilitude for the character mm. okay um, so now a bit of a whimsical question for you. Um, when you were younger, was there a power technology or fictional setting that you yearned for or to be part of? Uh, I don't know if I ever wanted to be part of. I really liked Star Trek. And mm -hmm. I also, I was a big Godzilla fan when I was a kid in elementary school because that was a time where they were showing the movies a lot mm -hmm. uh, on the independent stations. And, and you were seeing the Godzilla cartoon and the King Kong cartoon and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um so i was really into monster island and that and 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 reading about that and watching that on tv mm -hmm. um and uh star trek was in reruns we could see star trek on one of the independent stations mm -hmm. and lost in space and land of the giants but i don't think i always kind of uh star trek was probably the only one i wanted wanted to be in because that was the one it seemed like normal people could exist without getting murdered all the time like some of the others so uh but i never really was big on seeing myself in science fiction fantasy worlds or seeing myself in books at all i was always kind of an observer of the other characters okay. um so so the properties that you worked on you know as you mentioned stargate and star wars um how, how, what's that experience like in, in comparison to writing your own stuff? Um, well, Stargate Atlantis, I had a really good time with that one. Uh, that was a lot of fun. They don't, um, the show wasn't, uh, I think the show was in the second season or third season, but they didn't have a lot of oversight. They didn't have a really strong vision of what they wanted. The books were just kind of out there on their own. Hmm. So you could do a lot more um, interesting things with them. Um, Star Wars is very strict about what they want you to do, um, at least at that time period. I don't know what they're like now. That was before Disney bought them. Mm. Um, I probably had the most fun with Magic the Gathering because um, there was a lot of, I did the magic story um, for Dominaria and 
um, I got to work with a, a really good Nick, Nick Kelman, who is my editor, and, and you get to talk to other people about what it's going to be, and they had, an, they had an outline, but there were sections of it where it was like, we need this one thing to happen in this story, and you do the rest. <laughs> so I got to make up a lot of characters and, and do things and, and, and come up with stuff, and so that was just a lot of fun. That got to be then folded in for other people to play with later, you know, different stories, so that was kind of, that was really cool. That kind of being part of a group of people who are all working on one thing is, is a really nice experience. How did you get linked up with uh, doing the magic, the gathering work? Uh, through my agent, usually with media properties like that, mm -hmm. um, they want people to be recommended to them or they go out and look for people. Um, it's not like, it's not a thing where you submit to them, um, particularly for star Wars and, and, uh, that they're they're looking for writers who've all who've done who've already done books most mm -hmm. of the time I think as far as my experience goes there may be other you know it may be different now or whatever mm -hmm. I've uh, I've spoken to some writers who've who found their fame basically doing property work you know writing Star mm -hmm. Trek novels or Star Wars novels and and one of the complaints I've heard is that you know you kind of get typecast in you're you're a writer for that property and it's hard to sell your own personal works um you you've avoided that obviously but i'm just curious if you have comments on that i kind of think that was maybe earlier mm -hmm. um because when they did um this my star wars novel was part of a set of three that was going to be you know james s.a Corey did the second one and their author did the third one so they actually were looking for established science fiction and fantasy authors who wanted to do a star wars novel so, but it was interesting, the amount of people who wanted to typecast me when it came out, it was like, well, now you will do Star Wars novels and nothing else. And I was like, <laughs> you know, you would get that from fans. And I was like, will I? I don't think so. <laughs> I think it's just going to be that one. Um, and it's just really interesting the way people try to um, um, pigeonhole you like that. And they, when people will try to do that and just be you know, utterly astonished that, but you're a fancy writer and you wrote science fiction. And it's like, people do that. That was a lot more common when I was, um, you know, when I was first reading science fiction in the, oh gosh, the seventies. Um, a lot of people wrote both. It wasn't, there wasn't these really um, separate categories. I think we've kind of gotten away from that too. I think it was really the eighties and nineties maybe where it felt like there was so much pressure to have, pick a category and stay in it only do one certain thing mm -hmm. and that wasn't really what I grew up seeing I saw authors who did all kinds of different stuff mm -hmm. um, so I think we've gotten away from that now it seems like especially we've gotten there's so many good new writers doing you know so many absolutely cool things and different things um, and so many kind of different voices now and I don't think there's that much pressure to, you know, pin somebody down to epic fantasy, you know, when, when there's so much, so many people who have had success kind of, you know, creating their own, you know, bringing their own vision to that category and doing different things with it that don't make, they don't pigeonhole quite so easily. Mm -hmm. It seems like publishers and marketers, they'll want that sort of that easy that easy button where it's like, Oh, I can sell you as the, you know, the successful, whatever writer. Yeah. But I think they still kind of do, but it's like the, so many of the most successful books, I think you look at them like um, Nora Jemison's um, um, fifth season trilogy and how hard that is to pin down as one thing. It's got um, different sensibilities that some that feel more fantasy and some that feel more science fiction and it's really its own thing. And that's what people really loved about it. Mm -hmm. um, that it was taking, it was taking an epic feeling fantasy to kind of a, a new level um, that was very exciting. And so I think um, publishers and marketers that really know what they're doing are probably looking more for that. It's like the next, you know, let's continue this exploration and, um, you know, people are looking for um, things that are not just the same old, same old. Um, 
now forgive me if I might have I'm uh, the timeline of how, when when your works came out, I might be a little confused. But before before you did Stargate and, and Star Wars, were you doing fantasy or or had you done sci fi? No, I'd done mostly fantasy. Um, I my first book was in 1993, and I probably didn't do. I don't think I did the first Stargate novel until like 2005. Mm-hmm. So it was mostly fantasy. I had uh, four. Uh, standalone novels yeah four standalone novels and then a trilogy Mm -hmm. so it's interesting that um a a sci-fi prop that two sci-fi properties um wanted you even though you were fantasy it's interesting that they said hey you know you can do some sci-fi for us well i think um the star wars wasn't until 2014 i think i was a little better known at that point um so um yes this um i guess the stargate not uh, lance novels they were not they're they're still doing that 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 line Mm -hmm. but they were not looking for particular big name authors Mm -hmm. you know at that point they actually had some debut authors in in that line which i think was was is kind of unusual for media tie-in but Mm -hmm. um well it you know it is now i think Mm -hmm. um so yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, okay. Um, and also they're not very, they're not hard science fiction. You know, they're they're um, uh, space opera. Really, okay. it's sort of the superhero version of science fiction, where superhero is kind of its own thing because you can you can draw in so many elements of fantasy and for superhero, nobody you know everything's and anything goes. Mm-hmm. And Stargate Atlantis is more the space opera, super science kind of stuff. Where again, it's like as long as it fits that that milieu, you know. You can do it. Had you been a fan before when you were approached to do the work? Had you been a fan or did you have to do some learning? No, I, um, I've seen most of like, Stargate and um, I'd already been watching Stargate Atlantis on my own before okay. you know, um, I ever heard about that they were the books you could do and everything. So, mm-hmm. so it was kind of, so kind of yeah. easy, easy to move into that. And do that yeah. Work. I'd have trouble doing something that I wasn't a fan of, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so for this particular novella, for Fugitive Telemetry, did you have, and I forget if you mentioned it already, but any trouble, f- I guess you had a- a- any trouble finishing or publishing it, or was it pretty much? No, it was already contracted. Yeah, mm-hmm. all the murder bot, um, after the first two, everything's been contracted pretty, you know, far in advance. Mm-hmm. Um And after Network Effect, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And they were kind of asking me what, you know, are you going to do another one or do you want to do something else? You know, um, and I was playing around with different things and just kind of, I was having trouble getting started on something. And then I was like, okay, what if Murderbot finds a body in the space station? And, and that was kind of set that story off. And then I was able to tell them, yeah, there's going to be another one. So, um, mm. you know, I hate um, contracting for books that I'm far in advance, but that's what I've done now is actually there's going to be, um, they haven't announced the contract yet, so I'm not sure how much I can talk about that. Okay. But um, um, I kind of know what I'm doing for my next few books. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. I guess that's good. I mean, it gives you stability, even though there's the pressure yeah. of, oh, got to do this. <laughs> yeah, the, I was a little worried about the pressure, especially now with everything going on. It seems <laughs> this is, could be a really stressful situation. But then I started working on the fancy novel and thought, no, it's okay, I, I can do it. So. <laughs> okay okay good good um so where can um where can people find you online do you have a website social media i have a website marthawells.com mm-hmm. um and most but the most immediate stuff is probably on twitter um which is martha wells one because martha wells was already taken when i got on twitter mm. i also have a dream with journal um which i think is martha with dot org mm-hmm. um, i haven't been super active i used to be a lot more active and do book reviews and um, new book listings and stuff but again the plague <laughs> mm-hmm. i haven't been able i haven't gotten back into that yet and i really should mm-hmm. um, and, and so your twitter is is the number one martha wells numeral yeah, one the numeral one yeah okay okay 
and I'll spell your name for, for listeners and viewers. So Martha is M-A-R-T-H-A and Wells, W-E-L-L-S.com. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's all the questions I have. Do you have any parting thoughts or words? No, <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we went over quite a bit, so. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, we just had a, you know, we had yesterday here, there was a mass shooting, mm. uh, the mass shooting in Bryan, Texas. Mm. Um, it was very near here, um, mm. where actually it was across town where I used to live, uh, near where I used to live. And then a friend was in the hospital. And then we had a, a, a thunderstorm with a tornado and an ice a hail. <laughs> that destroyed our yard a little bit uh, oh, really? last night. So it's just been... <laughs> this day it's been kind of uh it's been a lot less uh antic than yesterday (laughs) wow wow well good good that it's um getting a little calmer i'm sorry to hear that going on (laughs) um all right uh well well thank you very much for speaking with me oh thank you it's been fun yeah it has thank you thank you (laughs) in the next episode i speak with josh mallerman author of bird box and goblin hit the subscribe button to catch that episode. Thank you for watching this video version of Full Contact Nerd Interviews. If you liked the episode, please subscribe and hit the like button. If you'd like more book suggestions or information on fiction and storytelling, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. If you're looking for military history and general history, including true crime, please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for space history and the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Space Walks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. Thank you for watching, and keep imagining the past, the present, and the future. Thank you.